Chapter 5 Contact Rookie's plan for capturing Fund had started late, but it came together fast. Charlotte's news that he'd be alone with Fund on the ISS was the spark. The ISS diagram on his computer screen was the kindling, and his flames were hot when he exited the craft. Surprise and speed would make quick work of Fun this time. Inside the airlock, unlike most astronauts, he left his bulky pressure suit on. He opened a nearby instrument panel, pulled down a heavy long handle switch, tapped his equipment pocket, and pushing on the sides, he floated face first along the tube connecting the airlock to the service module, the ISS's control room. He'd enjoyed the simulator when Charlotte taught him to navigate in a weightless environment at Cape Canaveral, but now he had no time to take any pleasure in it. He stopped the moment he spotted Fun strapped to a chair at the command console. He was staring out a small window. Uh, he was admiring his gigantic cigarette billboard. Ricky raised his face shield and he called out, You make me puke. Fun turned. Well, 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 my old nemesis. One of them, anyway. When I heard your stupid brother was going to show his artwork in Berlin instead of visiting New York, I said to myself, I bet that guy does his drawings on toilet paper and flushes them away. But hey, at least one of you is here. Something, however pathetic, is better than nothing. And as the old saying goes, a bozo in hand is worth two in the bush. Rookie said, well, I see you haven't changed. Now that I'm within 10 feet of you, I have to take a three-day hot shower when I get back to Earth. I'm sure you've figured this by now, you creep. I'm here to remove that outrageous billboard and bring you to justice. You're under arrest for violating the International Space Junk Treaty, and I bet a couple of countries back on Earth will invite you for a visit to their jails whenever your first term expires. Woo-hoo-hoo! Spoken like the high-minded twit you've always been. I'll actually be sad to see you go when... Ricky interrupted him with, That's enough foolish chatter. But since you mentioned going, I've cut both the Russian and American electrolysis systems as well as the Vika backup system. The oxygen level is already falling, so you'll soon notice you're even more slow-witted than normal. But not to worry. We'll be out of here in a few minutes. Ooh, ooh, I'm scared. Look, ooh, my knees are starting to shake. Heavens to asteroids, man. I'm trapped in a space station with a tough guy. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Fun was talking as sarcastically as he could. Ricky flashed the miniature laser burner he'd invented over their recent school vacation and said, I'm not wasting time, Fun. You're coming with me. There's a spare pressure suit out at the Zvezda dock at the airlock. Go put it on. Fun didn't move. He shook his head, smiled, and said, Bozo, I forgot how slow you are. I hate to rub it in, but let me tell you a few things, a few of the things I've already put over on you and your goody-goody gang. You're just playing for time, smoke man. Get moving. Oh, please, please indulge me for a moment, Mr. All-Powerful One. I'll start by giving you credit, even though it's a tiny credit. You use your gray brain to figure out I duped you with a change of address to 79 P Street. You figured a way out of that lock cement room. But before you get a big head at my compliment here, you should know that if I hadn't, if you hadn't succeeded in escaping, I had made a deal with a night watchman to let you steal his keys. Now that bit of generosity cost me because he wanted an advance bonus of 200 bucks for pain and suffering just in case you banged him on the head. But fortunately, you did escape on your own, ensuring 
You would see the drawings I tapped taped to the wall in the only office down there that had windows you could escape through. I knew when you saw them, you'd find a way to get here. After all, no true goody-goody could allow a dastardly criminal like me to place a super dastardly cigarette billboard up in space. Yeah, if you hadn't escaped by the road I planned for you, you would have missed the diagrams and might not have come up here to the ISS. Rook, he shook his head inside his helmet and said, Since Leo and I first encountered you in the Swiss Alps, I've thought a lot about your hatred for us, and I just don't get it. And now, why would you r ride a rocket 400 kilometers into space just so you can do me in? Well, I think you're losing your mind. Fun's nose wrinkled. His eyes narrowed, and a leopard snarl hissed out from the curl lips surrounded by his goatee. Don't believe everything you think, bozo. Listen to this. Rookie interrupted him again. Enough! Spare me whatever philosophy you're intending to spout, you sinister creep. You're coming with me, now. Hot foot it out to the airlock or I'll give you a hot foot with this little gem, he said as he waved his heat laser. Boone's demeanor and tone changed from the snarling leopard. Now he became a cynical toady. Oh, 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 sure thing, sure thing, Mr. All-Powerful Goody Goody, I'm a coming, I'm a coming. Rookie followed him at a safe distance, watched him put on the spare G-suit and said, Okay, open the airlock and get get into the back seat of my ship. Will do, will do. You're the boss. And he, and he gave an exaggerated bow to show his deference. But but oh hey sir, excuse me. This thing won't open. Rookie sternly ordered and pointed. Stand over there, face the wall. He went to the airlock and peered through its tiny window. He looked up, down, all around but his rocket was nowhere to be found. Fun turned and then leaned back against the wall with a huge grin on his face. He shook his head and mouthed, Bozo. Chapter six, help needed. Ricky floated back to the command console, placed a call to Amerigo, explained the situation and added, so, I guess I have to blame myself for not properly securing Elaine's rocket. Is there any chance you could come come up here and pick up my slimy captive and me? Ricky removed his pressure suit, feeling, you know, like a dog with his tail between his legs. Now he had to turn the oxygen back on and endure two days in close quarters with Fund. He secured him to the wall with a short tether and added a second one when he took a quick excursion to explore the cupola module and admire the view. But he cut that trip short because of the near view of Fun's huge mirror billboard it infuriated him. On the second day of being locked up with Fun, the radio sounded in America and announced he was nearing the ISS, adding, I'm concerned about that ro uh, docking portal, Rookie, with three cl closed off because of malfunctions and then your ship having escaped from the last supposedly operational one. Instead, I'll position my ship near the crew lock that they use for spacewalks. I can open it from the outside and we'll enter that way. Amerigo estimated it would take him two hours to manage this maneuver and asked Rookie to meet him at the crew lock. Amerigo's ship approached in slow motion, very slow motion. Rookie thought, have patience, man. It won't be long before we have this criminal back on earth and in front of a judge and jury. Chapter seven, the worst of times. When Amerigo signaled he was close, Rookie headed toward the crew lock with Fund in tow. 
He couldn't risk leaving them behind, so he tethered him to the corridor tube wall next to the crew lock, and he used another tether to tie his hands to its stability rail. He put on his pressure suit, entered the airlock, and listened for Amerigo turning the hatch crank. Ten minutes later, a light scratching sound signaled the crank's first revolution, and the scratching continued as Amerigo rotated it. When the hatch seal broke open, the door behind Rookie automatically closed and sealed. A shaft of light entered and the hatch door opened partway. Rookie saw the fingers of Amerigo's gloved hand reach around and pull it farther. When the hatch door was halfway open, a 50 centimeter long canister floated off the top of the door and toward Rookie. Tethered to a pressurized nitrogen tank by a flexible tube, it slowly rotated in a, in a gravity-free environment, and then it twisted rapidly like a pinwheel. Then it exploded, pushing a pressure wave out that knocked Rookie off balance. He was stabilizing himself when a second mammoth explosion blasted him against the wall. He lost consciousness. Moments later, Rookie opened his eyes. Only small thought fragments entered his consciousness. Where? What? what? He asked himself. When he realized he was floating, he, he became dizzy. He closed his eyes after a dozen breaths and opened them again. He was still dazed, but now realized he was inside the ISS, inside the crew lock, with most of his oxygen blown out into space. As he got his bearings, he saw the canister hanging like a popped balloon from the cracked nitrogen tank. The hatch door was wide open. There was no sign of Amerigo. His laser was gone, and he presumed it was now just another of the 34,000 pieces of space junk larger than 10 centimeters. The hatch now slowly closed. Part of Rookie's still battered consciousness told him that in absence of activity, the closing was automatic. But being only partially conscious, the slow progression of the hatch mesmerized him until he felt vibrations telling him it had sealed. What was Rookie mumbled after a jarring blow to his head. Floating near the airlock's door, he saw Fund and heard, Get your butt out of here, bozo. You're blocking progress. Then Fun braced himself on the wall and punched Rookie's shoulder. Move it, brain boy, or I'll stump your guts. Fun put a headlock on him and pulled him out into the corridor tube. He locked the airlock door, grabbed Rookie's pressure suit, and dragged him like a sack of dirt back into the service module. As Fun tethered him to a chair, Despair filled Rookie's entire being like a toxic fog. His mind's eye saw Amerigo helplessly drifting, lost in space. Guilt overwhelmed him. His eyes had no focus. Pulsing felt filled his ears in his pressure suit. It was the only thing that kept him from collapsing. He'd enjoyed the best of times in Heidelberg for a few days. But now the worst of times was on him. But this nightmare could last forever. Fun bounded up and shouted into his face, Basket case! A few minutes later, he stopped on his way elsewhere and said in a simply, in a slightly sympathetic tone, ah, I don't feel so bad, bozo. I guess you didn't get it. I had you down as a guy who always connected the dots into the big picture. I didn't realize how slow-witted you are. But look, what I said before still applies. Don't believe everything you think. Of course you're right that I detest you. I detest your brother and hope you both rot for eternity. But this isn't about you. It was never about you. It's about money. A hangdog look stayed on Rookie's face, and Fun said, Hey, get a grip on yourself. I don't want to leave a wounded puppy here while I blast out of here. Look, Bozo, you used to have an uncle, and I used to have an uncle. 
Mine's name was Johnstone. He's probably dead, but I can't know for certain. Anyway, the lawyers say he's legally dead, sucked into a wormhole. Johnstone wasn't anybody's idea of a nice guy. Quite the opposite. Ha, huh, I should say, quite the opposite, in fact. But you can't choose your family. Apparently, long ago, he named me heir to his fortune since I was his only relative. But he set a condition in the will saying if he died from anything other than natural causes, I'd get nothing unless I took public revenge for his untimely passing. When the lawyer said your uncle Amerigo was after him when he disappeared, that meant Amerigo had to die for, for the will to go into force and for me to inherit Johnston's fortune. Rookie, Rookie was beginning to return to full consciousness, but this talk seemed so preposterous. He wondered if the explosion had knocked him into a waking nightmare. Fund went on. I didn't want to take the chance of losing my inheritance by, you know, arranging a traffic accident or some more anonymous way for Amerigo to depart life. Quieter would have been safer for me. But if the lawyer decided I hadn't complied with the will, I'd been screwed. I needed something splashy, something sure to be reported on Fox News. But I couldn't figure out what it could be. Then when I was walking to my favorite diner one lunchtime, I passed the Space Services building and a wonderful idea came to me. I hacked into the CEO's email and lo and behold, found messages going back and forth with a marigo. At this moment, smugness and self-satisfaction came over Fun's demeanor as, as he continued. So... Well, figuring out how to capitalize on that, I thought, why don't you kill three birds with one stone? Why not nail you, Bozo, and your brother at the same time? Too bad for me your stupid brother can draw. Anyway, understand this. You, Bozo, were nothing but bait to get to your uncle. So you're predictable. Pathetically predictable. Really. All I had to do was sketch out a plan for putting a cigarette ad into space, and you, Bozo, saw it and took it all over from there. You made my whole plan play out as if you'd been a Broadway producer or a Hollywood movie mogul. Fun shook his head as he gloated, and then he floated around Rookie. You made it unbelievably easy, dopo. You know, I'm grateful to you. So grateful, in fact, that I'll forgive you for thwarting my plan out there in the South China Sea. His head was clear now. So Rookie looked at him unbelievingly, and he rolled his eyes. Fun responded, Oh, you don't think playing your part well is a big deal, eh? Well, it is, and I'll tell you the depths of my appreciation. Instead of forcing you out the crew hatch and dooming you to die a frightful death and float forever through space, I'm going to leave you here in the ISS and let you die a sweet death. Ah, what's a sweet death, you ask? It's simple starvation. You know, starvation. Like what happens to millions of poor people all over the place. Big deal. It's sweet. Rookie rolled his eyes again, and Fun responded, Hey, you should be grateful. Starvation beats drifting through space for, for eternity. Rookie was sick of Fun's blather, but he couldn't stop him, and it went on. I see you don't want to admit it, but since you've been so, so helpful to me, I'll even go the extra mile for you. When I wreck the water... And I wrecked the oxygen producing equipment on this sky crate. And when I destroy the food stored here, I'll save out one last meal for you. I've already decided what it'll be. I've chosen for you my own favorite Brussels sprouts.
Rookie involuntarily gagged at the idea of freeze-dried Brussels sprouts as his, as his last meal. Poon reacted with, Bozo, you still look sad. Cheer up. What more can I do to thank you for making it so easy for me? Rookie simply stared at the evil fiend who was playing with him, the way a cat plays with a cornered mouse. Poon threw out his hands and exclaimed, Ooh, ooh, I got it. I'll leave you a stack of paper like the one I left in, for you in the conference room in New York. You'll end your day strapped to this chair right where you are, unable to talk with a soul because the radios and communication devices were wrecked by yours truly. But I'll make sure you can write your brother letters. Letters that say how you wish you hadn't been high-handed and thwarted my vengeance on the WHO or wrecked my cigarette sales in Chamonix in Paris. Ah, uh, with all the nice things I'm doing for you, you know, I'm starting to feel like a goody-goody myself. Whoops, did you hear that? That's my co-pilot returning with my spaceship. By the way, he's a kind and generous guy, too. In fact, right after you arrived here, he kindly disconnected your ship from the docking station and sent it drifting out into space. And right now he's pushing Amerigo's ship away from the airlock. Rookie looked up at the smallest ray of hope in his eyes and Fun said, No, Bozo, not toward your uncle in the opposite direction. So, I have to leave you now and go kill off the water, air, food, and radios and make sure my co-pilot did a good job wrecking all the docking stations. We wouldn't want anybody to make a heroic effort to save you now, would we? Tethered and tied, Ricky dropped his head between his knees, trying to regenerate hope by breathing deeply and cleansing his mind. But darkness returned when, through the floor portal, he saw Amerigo in the distance, floating, floating, farther and farther away. Chapter 8, Drawing on a Friend's Wisdom Fun bounded into the service module a half hour later. He threw a freeze-dried pack of Brussels sprouts onto Rookie's lap and said, There it is, Bozo, your last meal. Sorry the microwave doesn't work. And although you might have been able to get some water out of the toilet there to reconstitute these goodies, you're all tied up, aren't you? But take heart from what's going oh, from what's on your lap. Brussels sprouts are really good for you. Ha <laughs> yeah, eat enough? and you'll live forever. At least that's what my old aunt used to say when she tortured me. Anyway, I'm out of here. Good riddance. Just as Fun started to float back through the corridor, he turned and said, ah, I imagine you're holding out hope that some rescuer, maybe your buddy Elaine Merck, will enter through the airlock and save you. Well, you can drop that sliver of hope because I'll be collapsing the solar panel across the hatch. No ship will be able to come close and that sturdy metal beam, it'll block everything. So long, sucker. Rookie's feelings were as dark as the corridor he'd navigated out of Fun's New York building. He wallowed in self-pity. He thought of the sadness Mom, Pops, and Leo would feel, and he said to himself, I could have done better. My life story did not have to end this way. Then, a force within him, a force he'd felt another time. That force made him sit up straight, and a sense of strength came into his chest. He thought, yeah, Min said it, but I think I always knew it. The one thing you can control is your attitude. I escaped Fun once, 
and I'm going to escape again. I'm going to save Uncle Amerigo. Ricky half-formed a plan that instant, and he refined it while chewing through the string binding his hands. He disconnected the tether, grinned, and said to himself, Time is of the essence, and this action man is on the move. No rockets to jump into? No problem. I got an entire space station at my disposal. Too bad I can't talk with Charlotte. She's a wonder, but when she told me how the ISS beast here could move to protect itself if a piece of space junk hurtled toward it, she gave me all I needed. Now, normally astronauts use the engines on their docked rockets to move their space station out of harm's way. But since the designers built redundancy into the ISS, they gave it its own boosters to boosters that did not require electricity. Ricky floated to the service module's smallest workstation. There's no power for its computer, but he found the paper emergency evasion manual. He closed his eyes for a moment and thanked the space station's engineers for designing it to activate without electricity and for giving him paper when the computer wouldn't work. I don't have a rocket to reach Uncle Amerigo, but I do have this big baby, he whispered to himself. He opened a panel of mechanical levers controlling nine thrusters. He looked through the portal at his target and pulled the first one, which provided a single second's burn. Ah, uh, but then he said out loud, yeah, wrong direction, I've lost sight of Amerigo. He reversed it and pulled another one. Not bad, he said to himself. Now let's take the trajectory down a notch. He fired a third. Hey, it's tracking perfectly. Hey, being lucky beats being good any day. The ISS moved toward Amerigo. Progress was slow, but that's what he wanted. He didn't want to blast, blast past him or worse, hit him. Glad he still had his pressure suit on, he floated toward the crew crew lock thinking sure hope fun was just blowing smoke when he said he'd disable it and sure wish i had a, a way to alert america that i'm coming ricky grinned happy at fun's error and not blocking the airlock but near panic followed seconds later he couldn't see amerigo did i miscalculate did he change his course somehow did i pass him do i have to light up the boosters again Fortunately, it was only a solar panel blocking his view. It was only about 50 meters away, and the ISS was slowly and steadily closing the gap. Time for action, action man. He connected himself to the 100-meter tether he'd taken from the equipment locker, focused on a point about 10 meters behind Amerigo, and leapt from the mod module. When he nearly reached his target point, Fearing a quick stop could make him tumble or pull him backward toward the ISS, he gently pressed the tether between his gloves to slowly stop his forward movement. Careful, careful execution brought him to the perfect interception point. Amerigo was facing away with his arms and legs and head totally immobile. A terrible hole opened in the pit of Rookie's stomach. A am I too late? The gap closed and contact was imminent. Amerigo still showed no sign of movement or life, but this was not the time for a rookie to think and think or worry and worry. Ricky pulled on the tether ever so gently to refine his position and he prepared for contact. He opened his legs as far wide as he could. He held the tether tightly in his outstretched right hand. He held his left in front to dampen the slight impact he expected and he wanted to avoid propelling Amerigo away. Contact! He wrapped his legs around Amerigo's waist, circled his neck and helmet with his left arm, and pulled the tether with his right. He wasted no time looking for Amerigo's reaction. All his attention was on returning to the ISS crew hatch without incident. Gotta avoid the solar panel. Gotta make a gentle contact. Gotta hold Amerigo at all costs. The 50, minute, the 50 meter run took no great strength, except for maintaining his grasp on Amerigo. 
but his energy was totally consumed by careful observations and contingency planning. What to do if, if America is unconscious or worse? What to do if I don't hit the sweet spot near the hatch? The distance to the ISS was closing. His direction wasn't bad, but he was moving faster than he wanted. He looped the tether twice around his tool belt, freeing his right hand, and he reached out to cushion their arrival impact. As he did, he saw through Amerigo's helmet visor, and a smile showed back. A smile. Heaven. Chapter 9. It ain't over till it's over. Amerigo reached out and put his glove around the grab bar near the hatch. Ricky did the same. They faced each other with satisfaction, but their challenges weren't over. Amerigo got to work first. Keeping, keeping the grab bar near his belly, he twisted his body in a half circle so that in reference to Rookie, who hadn't moved, he was now upside down. Spotting his rocket, the one Fun's co-pilot had released from his tether, he jabbed the air toward it, 70 meters away in the distance. After he rotated back, he pointed down to it again. Then he pointed to Rookie's chest and then to Rookie's tether. Rookie got the idea, gave a thumbs up with his space glove, pushed himself lower, and grabbed a strut below the hatch. After assessing the rocket's relative speed, he pushed off. On intercepting it, he was careful not to force the rocket's trajectory away from the ISS. He looked back at the ISS, knowing its solar panel's sharp edges would cut through the rocket's skin on the slightest contact and decided how he would aim. Inserting his glove hand into a latch recess while holding the tether in his other hand, he tugged ever so gently, knowing he'd have no way to slow the rocket. Rookie was the pitcher, Amerigo uh, was the catcher. The rocket was the runner rounding third and heading for the plate. The runner didn't slide exactly at the plate, but the catcher held the grab bar with one hand and captured the spacecraft with another. A life or death moment was playing out and Rookie watched it as though it were a TV show or a computer game. He was thinking, sure, Amerigo's real, but seriously, 400 kilometers above Madagascar? A gleaming space station on one side? A white spacecraft about to hit a spacewalker? A black sky showing no stars because Earth's light is so bright? Am I really here? Is this really happening? But action time arrived again and Rookie's spell broke when Amerigo grasped the nose cone's needle. He kept his grip on the door latch's recess and grabbed Amerigo's belt. The ship stopped within centimeters of the ISS, and then it moved back and away slowly. Amerigo nudged it in with infinite care until the rocket quietly floated next to the ISS, leading Rookie to ask himself, who would ever know that they were moving around Earth at 25,000 kilometers an hour? All of us. The two were now facing what Rookie imagined would be the trickiest maneuver of all, climbing into the floating spaceship. He had once tried climbing into a canoe while swimming in a lake, and his awkward effort flipped the canoe and sent his box launch into the deep. What would happen here where the rocket ship and crew were all weightless? Amerigo signaled Rookie to pull the door latch. It opened. It opened as simply as if it had been the door to Pop's car in the driveway. As Rookie held fast to the ISS, Amerigo pushed gently on his shoulder. He stretched himself out, and he flew in the door like an arrow. Rookie was astonished as he watched Amerigo squirm into the pilot's seat on the far side. Then on Amerigo's signal, he pushed gently against the ISS and made the rocket ship move slowly away from and he then grasped the bar under the seat and pulled himself up and inside. Amerigo arrested its movement, guided his torso toward the craft ceiling, and Rookie then wedged his legs downward and settled into his seat. He closed the door. Amerigo initiated pressurization, 
And as they waited for the pressure to reach the target level, the two acrobats faced each other with smiles as wide as their visors. Amerigo connected both their suits to the internal communication system, and the first sound Rookie had heard in hours arrived through his helmet's audio system. Thank you, bud, for the save. I should call you sir. Brilliant maneuvering. Rookie replied, Hey, Uncle Amerigo, it was the least I could do after almost getting you killed. Well, we're more than even. Let's get back to Earth, shall we? Sure, Rookie said, but let's do one more thing first. Name it, bud. Let's get rid of that cigarette billboard. Hmm, Amerigo said. There are hundreds of mirrors and wires in that thing. We can't risk them following our wing or our tail controls. Ricky said, I know a trick. We can use a tool Charlotte added to Elaine's newest rockets, including this one. Have you ever read about Archimedes? Ever hear of the Archimedes Claw? Sure, that dude just might have been the world's all-time best inventor. I had no idea Elaine had installed such gear on this puppy. Well, Ricky said, she showed me how to control the armature. The control's right here. Take a look. An arm popped from the side of the door. It articulated at an elbow point and ended with a, with a claw the size of a human hand. If you can get as close to any one of those wires, Ricky said, I'll grab it. And the whole thing, it'll just trail behind us as though it's our tail. The wires as well as the mirrors will burn up when we descend into Earth's atmosphere, and with luck, some amateur astronomer will record the billboard's collapse, and as the atmosphere thickens, we'll show humans the brightest shooting star they've ever seen. Margo maneuvered with the side thrusters. Rookie extended the claw, locked onto a wire, and announced, Okay, got it. We're in business. Excellent. Let's head for home, Amerigo said. You might even have time to catch the final day of Leo's art exhibit. And with that, he punched a button and lit up the ship's tail thrusters with a whoosh. Ricky said, ah, music to my ears. We didn't burn fun uh, today. Wish we could have burned fun. But at least we'll burn his billboard. And one more thing. When Fun sailed off the Eiffel Tower to parts unknown and later flew away in the South China Sea, we had no way to locate him. But now, now we know where he lives. Amerigo smiled broadly and said, Rookie, my boy, go after him when the time's right. And if you want help, sign me up. The end. <laughs>